Good morning. Welcome, people of hope. Uh, I am glad. I'm glad to be back. It's been a while. I was looking at my calendar, and I realized the last time I preached was right at the end of February, beginning of March. And then, uh, you know, my wife and I were anticipating a baby. It's been a little while, and um, and then things changed a lot <laughs> while we were at home. So we are in a different situation, a different scenario. But I am thankful to be back to uh, study the Word of God together. Before we get moving, uh, I want to do a little family announcement, a little church family announcement. Hopefully it'll pop up on the screens here. Uh, Jared Blue and Christina Blue uh, just had a brand new baby, Jordan Ray Blue, born May 11th, 2020. A healthy little baby. We're so excited for them. So please pray for them as they uh, begin the wonderful and also very exhausting task of parenthood. Okay. So today we're going to be going into 1 Corinthians, uh, but the first thing I want to do, uh, I just want to offer a few pastoral words about our present crisis, what's happening right now. This last week, the stay-at-home orders have been extended for uh, some number of weeks, and I know that everyone is stressed out and overwhelmed. And as I've watched uh, the pressure grow in, in our society, in our local community, and also on social media, uh, I'm seeing two polarizing responses to uh, COVID-19. And I just want to, I want to address these two extremes. And I want, I want to get there by way of illustration. You may know that uh, my wife and I also had a baby uh, about five weeks ago now. Her name is Theodora. She's healthy. She's, um, as I said earlier, e- exhausting. And if you are a parent, uh, if you are a parent of a new baby, or you remember being the parent of a new baby, or you're a grandparent that's cared for a new baby, uh, you know, um, those first few weeks, they are absolutely exhausting. They're tiring. And there's, there's different ways that, that parents can respond to the fact that they are exhausted. Uh, one of those ways, it, it, which is totally unacceptable, would be open revolt, complete abdication of the responsibility to their baby. Parents don't do that, but it would be one extreme option. That would be terrible. The other option, which I think is equally terrible, even though it's a little bit less obvious, is utter resignation to say, I'm tired, I'm not sleeping, things aren't going well, I'm overwhelmed. I guess this is what my life will always be like. My life will never return to any sense of normalcy. I'm seeing those two sorts of responses uh, to to the COVID-19 crisis, especially as we're asked to stay in our homes for a longer period of time. One of those extreme responses is open revolt, to say, we've had enough, we're no longer going to listen to our governmental civil authorities We're ready to go out and do whatever it is that we want, whenever we want. And I want to say to you that as the church, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to, as Paul commands, be obedient to our civil authorities and to be a powerful witness of sacrifice to the community around us. As far as I can tell right now, this is not persecution directed uh, specifically at the church. It's hard for everyone, but it's not persecution, at least not yet. And because of that, we're called to be obedient and faithful witnesses. I don't want us to respond through open revolt. The other response, the other extreme that's like worrying me a little bit is utter resignation. Uh, Just to say, hey, listen, we've now moved to a streaming service in church. People are not gathering together. This is what it's going to be like forever. Church is evolving. It's going to be a new hybrid method. It's becoming something new. And I want to say to that, no, Absolutely not. What we're doing right now is an approximation of church. We're doing the best we can to study the word of God, to sing praises to Jesus, to like sort of virtually gather and approximate what we do when we do our Sunday worship service. But it's an accommodation for right now. It's temporary. It might be a long temporary. It might be a back and forth where we get to meet a little bit and then we have to do this for a little bit. I don't know. The point is this. The church is the physical gathering of the Lord's people locally. It will never, ever be anything else. And we should longfully and hopefully look forward to when we will be able to do that again, no matter how long this period lasts. This is not going to beat the church. The Black Plague didn't beat the church. The Spanish flu didn't beat the church. Polio didn't beat the church. World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the Great Recession, and all other sorts of scourges and plagues against humankind have not overcome the church. This is not going to do that either. So here's what we are called to. Faithful living now and hopeful living for a future where we are gathered together again. 
I wanted to say that because I think it's important for us to live in those two spaces. So now, please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10, 23, and we're going to read together. We read Paul say uh, to the church at Corinth, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to a dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. <clears throat> give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Uh, I love this passage, and I just want to remind us of a little bit of background. Uh, Corinth is a city that was full of idolatry. It was a city that was preoccupied with status. It was a city that had all kinds of licentiousness sexually, and it was a city that was wealthy. It looked a lot like our context today. And when we read about Paul's life, when we read about Paul's life in, in the letter of Acts, we see that he goes into Corinth and he preaches the gospel. And as he preaches the gospel, uh, former Jews and former pagans become Christians, and a church is born in that city. And Paul labors alongside them as their pastor for a long time. He's close with them in ministry. He gets to know them. He loves them. He gives himself over to them. And then, as was the case for Paul, because he's called to this broader missionary effort, he leaves. And a little while later, he hears reports about the church at Corinth, this church that he loved, this church that he pastored, this church that he sacrificed for. And the reports are dramatic, and the reports are disturbing. And he also receives a letter from the church. And he finds out all kinds of things that are happening in the church that are really, really uh, uncomfortable to Paul. So he writes back to them. That's what we get, the first letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians. He writes back to them. He begins by describing to them the unity that they have in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ crucified. And then he begins to address a series of issues that are relevant to them. And we're now on the issue of idol worship and meat sacrificed to idols. Paul is going to do big picture and small picture work here. He's going to do big picture work and small picture work. He's going to get into the weeds and talk about all kinds of details that are going to be really helpful and really pastoral. And then he's going to connect the, these specific things he says to them up to the greatest and largest foundational ideas in Christianity. He's going to talk about how people in their daily lives can be imitators of Jesus. He's doing really beautiful and really clever and really marvelous pastoral theology. This week as I was preparing and I was reading different commentaries and diving into the word and thinking and praying and reflecting on what Paul had to say, like I was pastored by Paul. Really, I was pastored by Paul. My heart was convicted in certain ways. My heart was encouraged in certain ways. And my prayer is that this morning, you will also be pastored by Paul. And here's the basic premise of these verses. The basic premise is that Christians have liberty. They possess this concept, this idea, this quality that is often called Christian liberty or sometimes Christian freedom. And here's what, it, here's what it boils down to. Christians have core central beliefs that are essential to them being Christians. But beyond that, there's a great deal of variety and flexibility. Christians are not told how to dress. They're not told what to eat. They're not told what their vocation must be. They're not told how they have to vote. Instead, there is a wide range of different beliefs when it comes to secondary issues. Christians have a great deal of liberty. Why? Because it is essential that Christians know 
that their salvation is dependent not on what they do, but on what God has done. That's why Christian liberty is important. So Paul is going to begin to work through some of these issues. And uh, unlike Judaism and unlike paganism at the time, Christian liberty would cause this unique uh, problem within the Christian church. And the unique problem was this. There would be two extreme responses to Christian liberty, two types of people. The first, I'm sure you've heard of before, is the legalist. The legalist would minimize the freedom that he or she has in the gospel. They would minimize it. They would have what we might call an overactive conscience. And what they would say is it's so essential that I do all of these secondary things. And then many of them would go a step further and say, and it's also essential that everyone else shares my same preferences. Someone who is a legalist ends up living a life that is marked by judgmentalism and moral arrogance. It's someone who does not take the gospel as seriously as they should. The second sort of person is the libertine. This is someone who maximizes the freedom that they have in the gospel, so much so that they exploit it or they assume on it. It's someone with an underactive conscience, someone who doesn't take Christian freedom seriously in the way they should that that leads them to uh, destructive and and God-dishonoring patterns of sin. So one person assumes too much freedom, And one person assumes too much confinement. We actually see uh, both of these figures in Jesus' famous parable of the prodigal son. I'm not going to read the whole thing here. It's one of my favorite parables, and I'm sure uh, many of you, it's your favorite parable. We know the story. There's the younger son. The younger son goes to his father, and he asks for his inheritance early, which was very dishonorable. But the father gives it to him, and the son goes off to a distant place. And while he's there, he lives a licentious, sinful life. And then things go sideways and he loses all of his money. He's been the libertine, the one who's fallen into a pattern of destructive sin. So he goes back to the father in repentance and the father receives him back. But then the story continues and we see the other figure. We see the legalist. The father finds the older son who's pouting out in the shed, who's angry because the younger brother has come back home and received forgiveness in a way that seems unwarranted. And the father says to the older son, you've always been here. You've always had everything that I've had. The older son has become to assume that he is owed some blessing because of his own righteousness. We see the libertine and we see the legalist. We see both of these figures in the parable of the prodigal son. And Paul in this passage is going to address both the legalist and the libertine. He's going to jump back and forth. I'm going to try and carefully walk through with you when he's addressing one figure and when he is addressing the other. And and really what this passage sort of centers around is not what is specifically right and wrong, although that does matter. It's more about how our actions affect other people. That's what Paul's primary concern here is, how our actions affect other people. Now, I want to I just offer one warning. As I was preparing this week, and I began to think about these two different figures, the legalist and the libertine, I'm like, which one am I? Am I the legalist? Do I, don't, like, do I not assume that I have freedom? Am I a little bit judgmental? Am I, am I the sort of person that has moral arrogance? Or am I the libertine who uh, falls into destructive patterns of sin, who assumes on the gospel, who exploits the gospel? And I think here's the important point, that, that uh, a conclusion I came to this week. Uh, I'm both. I am both brothers. I am ready to liberally excuse my own sin and legalistically accuse others of theirs. I am both brothers. It's so easy for me to read this passage and say, I only need to listen to the parts that address the legalist or the parts that address the libertine. But I want to take all of Paul's medicine. I want to hear everything he has to say. And I want the legalist in my heart and the libertine in my heart to be put to death. Paul does this in three stages. The first is this, the foundation of Christian liberty. The foundation of Christian liberty. Read again with me verses 23 through 26. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat Whatever is sold in the meat market, without raising any questions on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's, 
and the fullness thereof. Paul's opening line summarizes like the essential nature of his argument that he's going to run through the entirety of these verses. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. He says again, all things are lawful, but not all things built up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Paul begins with a quote that probably the libertine group within the Corinthian church was saying. They were saying, all things are lawful. And it's a quote that Paul quotes back to them because he does agree with it. However, it is qualified. He says, all things are good, but not all things build up. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. And then he goes on to explain what he means. Do not seek your own good. Seek the good of others. See, holy living matters. Paul does want to communicate to the Christians at Corinth, and he has already in this letter, and he will continue to do so how a Christian should behave, how they can live holy lives. But he is approaching this dispute between the legalist and the libertine on specifically the issue of eating meat in particular context, not from the angle of what is wrong and what is right, that still matters. He's approaching it from the angle of uh, how do your actions affect other people? That's a really fruitful way to approach this issue. It's a really powerful way to approach this issue. He's saying to them, Don't just ask if something is allowed. Ask if it helps other people. Ask if it's centered around other people. Ask if it benefits other people. Ask if it causes unity and not division. So here's the issue that specifically the church at Corinth was dealing with. The church at Corinth was dealing with the issue of meat sold in the marketplace. Now you remember Pastor Mike last week was talking about meat eaten like in a temple as part of ritual sacrifice. And Paul says to that, no, do not eat meat sacrificed to idols in the temple because you, will, you cannot help but be caught up in the worshipful aspects of, of, uh, of those idols when you eat meat in that context. The, the problem wasn't the menu, the meat itself. It was the venue, the context that they were in. Now, a lot of the meat that was sold in the meat market in the, cities of, in the city of Corinth, that was meat that was left over from temple sacrifice. And so some Christians were asking, hey, so we know that we can't go into a temple and eat meat in that context because it's sort of a form of worship. But what about meat that has been sacrificed to an idol that is now not in the temple anymore? It's not in the midst of pagan rituals. Now it's just in the marketplace. Can we eat that meat? Now, the, the uh, legalist would say absolutely not, especially if they were formerly Jewish because Jews spent a great deal of time trying to find the origin of their meat and if it had ever been used in idol sacrifice. If you were a libertine, you would say, yeah, of course we should. Everyone should. We're not bound in that way. It's just meat. So Paul's approaching that division. That's how the church is divided. Paul addresses the legalist first. He addresses the legalist first. He says, when you go to the meat markets, buy whatever you want without raising an issue of conscience. Paul's saying, you don't need to worry about the origin of that meat. Now that the meat is not in the, uh, in the temple, the meat is just meat. He's saying to the legalists, do not demand of yourself or of other people more than what the Lord requires. He's elevating the idea of Christian liberty. He's saying, do not constrain yourself more than you have to, because when you do that, it's easy to forget the power of the gospel. And he grounds this idea that you can eat this meat in a sort of created order. He goes first to Psalm 24, 1. We read, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. Paul is saying, God owns everything. (laughs) Every single thing in the world belongs to God. Creation is good and creation is meant to be enjoyed. We see further, Paul says something else in 1 Timothy. We read, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars, those consciences are seer, whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God 
and prayer. Paul is saying the meat is just meat. God's creation is good. And Christians are not called to only one small sliver of human experience. They are called to enjoy a large part of God's creation. Paul is again saying it's not the menu, the meat itself, it's the venue where it is eaten. Now, uh, for us, this seems like a really far off issue. None of us are going into like Ralph's and wondering if the meat we're buying there was sacrificed to an idol. But there's all kinds of other ways that we can see this premise being important for our lives. Medication is not sinful to take. Addiction is. Sex is not intrinsically evil. Adultery is. Money is not evil to have. But greediness is. We can eat food. We should not be gluttonous. You may remember Mike talked about this a little last week. It's not what you have. It's what has you. And a sign that something has you. A sign that some element of God's creation has been transformed in your brain from a good thing to an ultimate thing such that it is now an idol that you worship is when you use that thing in a sinful way. The meat is not bad, but as a part of a ritual, it is bad. You should know that you are free. You have Christian liberty. You are able to experience all sorts of different things in this world. However, it is how and when and in which context you use them that renders them either holy or unholy. Paul continues now. He's not done. He has more to say. He's described to them Christian liberty, the freedom they have in the gospel. He's trying to anchor their hope in the work that God has already done, not anything that they can do now. And he moves on to the application of Christian freedom. Read with me in verse 27. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So before we dive into this section, I want us to remember verses 23 and 24. I'm going to read them again. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. In the first section, in verses 23 through 26, Paul is conveying that all things are lawful. But in this next section, in 27 through 30, he's conveying that not all things are helpful, not all things are beneficial. Paul is going to do this balance act between Christian freedom and Christian love. Christian liberty and Christian love. He's going to say, your Christian liberty, the great freedom you have in the gospel, it is constrained by how it enables you to love other people. Christian liberty is constrained by Christian love. And he communicates this by putting next to each other two different scenarios, two different hypotheticals. Situation one, you're invited to dinner. An unbeliever invites you to his house for dinner. He's like, if you want to go to the unbeliever's house and have dinner, go ahead. And when you go there, if he offers you meat, don't worry about where the meat came from. The meat itself is not sinful to eat. Don't raise an issue of of, of conscience regarding it. He affirms the person's Christian liberty. And then he brings in scenario two, situation two, which is slightly different. He says, however, if you go to an unbeliever's house for a dinner and they offer you meat and someone announces to you, this meat has been sacrificed to idols, don't eat that meat. It's the same meat, but Paul is calling for a different choice. Same actual content on the plate, right? But he's saying in these two circumstances, You should do different things. In the second circumstance, someone has announced that this meat has been sacrificed to an idol. 
Paul says, don't eat it. He is not saying don't eat it because somehow the meat has been sort of contaminated spiritually with demonic forces. It's not about that. It's about how you eating that meat affects other people. He says, on the part of the one, or for the sake of the one who told you that the meat was sacrificed to idols, for the sake of conscience, his, not yours, don't eat the meat. There are at least three reasons why this could be the case. And and this second scenario is is a little bit vague. It's not 100% clear who is the one announcing that the meat is sacrificed to an idol. There's three different ways to take this. And and I'm going to explain all three different ways that we can take this passage. But it's important to understand that all three of these ways convey the same truth, that Christian liberty is constrained by Christian love. That Paul's concern here is how your actions, if you're the one at that dinner, affect other people. The first thing that could happen if you eat this meat that has been announced to have been sacrificed to idols is you have your witness shattered. You have your witness shattered. Let's say it was the host, the pagan host that announced this meat has been sacrificed to idols. Well, a little bit of background history uh, really tells us that one of the big tests of Jews being devoted to Yahweh was that they would not eat meat sacrificed to idols. It was a way of expressing their devotion. And a few centuries before Paul is alive, there's this terrible tyrant named Antiochus Epiphanes. It's a big name. Don't worry about it. He would roll through Jerusalem every now and then. And when he would, he would try and force Jews to eat meat sacrificed to idols. And sometimes when they wouldn't do it, he would kill them. And you have all these stories in Jewish literature around the time of brave Jews saying, no, we will not eat sacrificed meat. And then they are put to death. And it's a story about devotion to God. And it's very likely that people who were alive at the time would have been aware Jews do not eat meat sacrificed to idols and probably would have assumed along with that that Christians do not eat meat sacrificed to idols. Otherwise, they are in some way, shape, or form denying Christ. It may be the case that this person invited you over to the meal and now they're trying to trap you in a moral dilemma. Paul says, listen, If you're told by the host that it's meat sacrificed to idols, don't eat it. And if that's the scenario, not eating it conveys your devotion to Jesus, conveys your devotion to God, which is actually, in this case, loving your neighbor well. Because you're showing that person that you trust God more than you trust yourself. That's the first way this could be taken. Another thing that could happen is a believer is offended that you ate the meat. Let's say you're at the dinner party with more than one person. It's you and another believer, and the other believer sees the meat and leans over to you and says, hey, listen, this meat was sacrificed to idols. And this other believer does not have nearly as strong a sense of Christian liberty as you do. Maybe they're formerly a Jew, and they find it detestable that anyone would eat meat sacrificed to idols. It's so ingrained in their heart. Even though they might know intellectually they have the right to eat meat, it still pricks their conscience. Paul's saying, listen, in this case, if you're going to offend someone else, you can relinquish, you can, you can uh, set aside your Christian liberty to eat this meat for the sake of this brother who might be offended. He's saying, why cause disunity? Give it up. The meat's not worth it. Another one is this. A believer is tempted. The third scenario is maybe there is a believer there with you who's a former pagan. The meat's brought, and it's that former pagan who leans over to you and says, hey, this meat is sacrificed to idols. And, and for that pagan... Uh, it's, it's part of his former life. E- eating meat sacrificed to pagan idols is an act of worship, and it is still really hard for him to separate eating this meat sacrificed to idols and worshiping those idols. He doesn't want to fall back into the sin of worshiping something, something else. So Paul's saying, don't eat the meat. Encourage and support your brother. In all of these cases, and we're not sure which one it is, but all of them, they're pointing to the idea that Christian love constrains Christian liberty. Christian love constrains Christian liberty. That is how Christian liberty is applied. Paul's saying that's how it's applied. You think of the good of the other person. Lastly, Paul talks about the purpose of Christian liberty. Paul talks about the purpose of Christian liberty. Read with me these last few verses. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul does something marvelous in these last verses here. He has been in the weeds. He has been dealing with the very specific issues of those in dispute. It's like when I go into my kid's room and I'm trying to figure out who had the action figure first and I'm really, really in the weeds on it. And then what Paul does after being in the real specific daily minutia of life stuff, he just like increases his vision to the foundational elements of Christian belief and to the person of Jesus Christ. It is marvelous that Paul can go from Should we eat meat in these specific contexts to how do we imitate Jesus? It's marvelous. It's so powerful to me. And I I, I can't help but think about our present situation. Our present situation uh, where we have this global health pandemic. And and, and and the pressure's been rising, right? We've watched numbers go up. We've watched more and more places shut down. We've seen all kinds of really, really terrible consequences of this this present problem. And in the midst of it, also at the same time, uh, posts on social media has been pressure rising. I go on Facebook and I read some intense stuff. Intense stuff. I see people being called cowards because they're wearing a mask. And I see people being called murderous because they want to reopen segments of our economy or society. I see people offering the least possible charitable view to someone else. And I see Christians doing this. I just want to ask this question. How can Christian liberty, as we see it described by Paul here, be constrained by our Christian love as we see it uh, described by Paul here? Do I have the right to my view on this pandemic? Yes. Do I have the right to express my view on this pandemic? Yes. Do I have the right to do that at the expense of my brother's well-being? No, I don't think so. Or if you do, it should be constrained by Christian love. What if... What if people looked in on our social media and they saw Christians who disagreed on the secondary issues but then had beautiful unity such that they could say, oh, these people, they loved each other. Not giving up your views, but giving up your rights around those views. Here's four diagnostic questions. Just four questions we can ask in our daily lives and small and big decisions. All of these questions are not me-centered. They're not how much can I get away with or what's technically okay or uh, anything like that. They're very specifically how our choices affect other things. And secondly, you have to ask all four of these questions because if you only ask one and not the other, you're really actually not asking any of them. You can't love your neighbor and glor- without, glorifying your go- without glorifying God. And you cannot glorify God without loving your neighbor. So these four questions. The first one is this. Does this glorify God? Does this glorify God? Does it honor God? Does it declare that God is great? Does it express my trust in God? Does it say that he is worth worshiping? And then Paul, he's saying this, like we can see this, he goes, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. Whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. Paul's saying, hey, listen, I'm not just talking about meat. Talking about everything. Not talking about a short period of time on Sunday. I'm talking about the whole week. He's saying every aspect of our lives, they should glorify God. I think um, for me, when I think about this passage, uh, I I always think of something that that, uh, John Piper said, and and it's not not something that I came up with. I just think it's so helpful. He says, uh, God gives you money so that you can show the world that money is not your treasure. Christ is. He says, God gives you sex so you can show the world that sex is not your treasure, Christ is. The things that we have in this world that have been given to us that are good and that we have the right to partake in, they should be used to glorify God. That's the question we need to be asking. 
is this, does, does this choice, does this decision, does this lifestyle, does this whatever, glorify God? Paul says, whatever you do, bring glory to God. Second question, does this build up others? Does this build up others? Paul continues, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many. Paul says this is a fundamental question. Does this build others up? If it doesn't build others up, by the way, it doesn't glorify God. Now, I think there are things that we can't disagree over and still call each other Christians. We can't disagree on the resurrection of Jesus. We can't disagree on the authority of the Bible. But there's a whole world of things that we can disagree on. And one of the questions that you need to ask, that we need to ask when we make statements, when we put social media posts up, when we hang out with people and spend time with people is, does this build the other person up? Am I building someone or am I destroying someone? And part of the way we build other people up is we relinquish rights that we have so that they might be encouraged and built up and helped. Third question, does this bear gospel witness? Does this bear gospel witness? Paul continues, he says, I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. That they may be saved. What is the point of it? Paul's saying, not only do you build your brother up, but your behavior as one who lives a self-sacrificial life, relinquishing your own rights on behalf of others is something that communicates the power of the gospel to other people. It's a witness. You're saying something else matters more. Something else matters more than me knowing that I'm right. Something else matters more than me being wealthy. Something else matters more than me being successful. People are attracted to devotion. People are attracted to to devotion? Does our lifestyle make people listen or make people laugh when we talk about Jesus? Lastly, he says, imitate me as I Christ. Does this imitate Jesus? It's a masterstroke on Paul's part. He's, he's like talking about meat sacrifice to idols and whether it's in the marketplace or it's on a, on a plate and it's really specific and it's an everyday thing. And then he works his way all the way to Jesus. And he says, listen, the choices you make, whether you eat the meat or don't, is it you imitating Jesus? He says, there's a model. There's a model for how we live our lives. You know, um, WWJD, uh, what would Jesus do? I don't really like WWJD. I'm sorry if you guys are like wearing WWJD shirts right now or bracelets and you're like taking them off. Just relax. I don't think we should do WWJD. What would Jesus do? Because it pushes us into the realm of speculation. What would Jesus do in this situation or that situation? Instead, we should ask, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Because that presses us into the word of God. Paul's saying, what did Jesus do? How do you imitate Jesus? What did he do? Oh, he was in the very form of God, but did not consider equality with God a thing to be presumed upon, so he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. He walks a humiliating road to a humiliating cross, and we ask this question, would Jesus stand on his rights? And the answer is no, he died before he stood on his rights. Jesus lived a life of self-sacrifice, not a life of self-assertion. His love constrained his liberty. Paul says, imitate me as I Christ. And, and apparently the Corinthians didn't fully grasp this because he says something else to them in his second letter. I, I want to go there now. Uh, I want this to be something that, that we end on. Uh, he says to the church at Corinth, the second time he writes them, uh, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God. God, and not us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. 
For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This should be our collective testimony. Individually and corporately, we should, we should live lives where we die to ourselves so others might live. That's what it means for our love of others to constrain our liberty. Do we have freedom in Christ? Yes and amen. Should that freedom lead us and compel us to give that very freedom up in order to love those around us well? Yes and amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our time this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I pray this week as we continue to dwell on your word, as we return to this passage, as we prepare our hearts for the next passage, that you would continue to conform us to the likeness of your son. That we individually, that we in our homes together now with our kids and with our husbands, with our wives, their sons, our daughters, grandmas and grandpas, would live lives of self-sacrifice, liberty constrained by love, dying so that others might live, But also, Father, I pray corporately as a body of believers, we would bear a powerful witness to those outside the church who see people who care about others more than themselves because they care about your son the most. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us this week that you would inspire us this week, that you would increase our trust in you and and the vision we have of your son during this difficult time. Remind us that you reign, that you're the Lord of everything, that we can't see this small virus, but you can, and that you are the only one truly able to save. As tragic as all this stuff that's happening right now is, I pray that we would be reminded that you can make good things come out of bad things, And that ultimately, our greatest hope is in the work that your son does at the cross. Pray all these things in his great name. Amen.